Let's have a little look at language. Key for me at the beginning is the euphemisms. Guardians, training, students, carers, donations, referrals, completion, agitation. When actually these are these euphemisms are taught to them to keep them passive. For me, this always makes me think of the way the creature learns language and the way he makes sense of the world by watching the de Lacy's. Now, this is really important. When you read Frankenstein, don't move swiftly through the de Lacy's because they are key to the way the creature understands family life, idealizes humanity. He learns about humility and generosity. So the de Lacy's are key to the way he understands it. Also, for example, the fact, the fact that Safi arrives and rejects the, uh, the harem, seeks for equality, and she, although she marries Felix, she gets equality. She's taught to be academic by Felix. Safi is taught to read, so she knows multiple languages. She's taught um, highly academic texts. This is a very surprising example of womanhood in the middle of the narrative, and she's very easy to miss if we just read it quickly, thinking, all right, the creature's looking in a crack. And the idea of looking in is exactly what the students do at the cottages they watch the tv and similarly the students watch the tv at the cottages and copy the behavior the creature watches the delacies through a crack and copies their behavior and you'll look at this in chapters one and two as well about the, the language they use the students by the way when they are young teenagers don't use language like young teenagers similarly the creature is only two years old and his phrasing let's just glance for a moment so into chapter 11 so for me, it's page 105, 106. For the rest of you, it's chapter 11. In the other edition, that's, it might be page 80. So let's just have a little look at this. What's interesting is the creature from the beginning is clearly so pure. Soon a gentle light stole over the heavens and gave me a sensation of pleasure. I started up and beheld a radiant form rise from among the trees. I gazed with a kind of wonder. It moved slowly, but it enlightened my path. So he has this understanding of nature and beauty that clearly suggests he is a noble savage. That's meant to be AO3. Okay, so he's clearly a noble savage, which was John Locke's idea. And then he talks about one day when I was oppressed by cold, he finds a fire. So he's Prometheus or Adam finding fire. Discovery is natural. But what's interesting is his phrasing is not like a child. His phrasing is not like someone who's self-taught. His language is not basic. In fact, his phrasing is much more complex and fluent than Frankenstein's. He is clearly noble. What's interesting is, of course, his first experiences of humanity. And its paragraph starts with, on for me, it's page 108. It's a paragraph which starts with, it was about seven in the morning. And for the rest of you, I think, 82. Yeah. I would want you to compare this with page 10 of Never, which we're going to do a little later. The treatment of the creature and the treatment that the students do of one another. It was about seven in the morning and I longed to obtain food and shelter. At length, I perceived a small hut on rising ground, which had doubtless been built for the convenience of some shepherd. This was a new sight to me. I examined the structure with great curiosity, finding the door open. I entered. An old man sat in it near a fire of which he was preparing his breakfast. He shrieked, ran out of the hut, ran across the fields. His appearance and his flight somewhat surprised me. But he's enchanted by the hut. And he. this is his first experience of humanity. Humans he encounter react with horror. Now, I'm going to come back to that in context a little bit later. Now, this is key in never. And I'm going to add some of the context onto that later. He's treated as other. Then what happens is the whole village, children shrieked, one of the women fainted, the whole village was roused. It's on page 82 in the other edition, about 10 lines up from the page, the bottom of the page. The whole village was roused. Some fled, some attacked me until grievously bruised by stones and many other kind of missile weapons. I escaped to the open country and fearfully took refuge in a low hovel. And of course, at the end of the novel, when Tommy and Kathy go and see Miss Emily, she admits that they were revolt. They were revulsed by the students. I'm going to find that for you, which is page 264. So it's page 264. We're all afraid of you. So we want to cross-reference with chapter 11 and whichever page is yours. CF means cross-reference. What do they learn about humanity? What do they see? How are they treated? Good, then let's go on to dignity and humanity. The strive for dignity. 
and I think this is really interesting, that we've got in both novels the sense of these characters who want to be dignified. They want to be treated as humans. And they also want to be ordinary. And I've got a couple of notes here that you can look at later. Kathy, for example, and Tommy go to Woolworths and they try and experience normality when they go to Norfolk, the place of lost things. They want to be normal. They want to be ordinary. They go into shops. They buy things. They look around. In the art gallery, when it's assumed that they are humans and they are art students, they really enjoy the experience of being considered as human. 140, they have dreams. So 140, they have dreams of being able to go to work, to work in an office. It couldn't last, of course, is what they say on 140. In fact, she admits it couldn't last, of course. But like I say, just for those few months, we somehow managed to live in this cosy state of suspension on page 140 of Never Let Me Go. The belief that there are other futures for them, the belief in other futures, page 56 and 57, the belief that they are ordinary, that someone might give them a pencil case because they are special. Ruth's smile, her finger on her lips, those are quotations from, from page 56, that is if Miss Geraldine had shown favours to her. The belief that an adult, a parent figure, would treat you as special. And also the desire to be ordinary. In the middle of page 204, the paragraph starts, even the solitude I've grown to quite like. About seven, eight lines into the paragraph, it says, here in my bedsit, I've got these four desk lamps, each of a different colour. She buys desk lamps as if she needed them to work. She likes being able to buy things, be a consumer like humans. The idea that she can, like humans, be consumers, buy things, own things, need to have things in her home. And similarly, the creature in chapter 11 just wants to be normal. And of course, that's why he wants a wife, a female creature. This desperate want to be human, to be accepted, to have love, to have normality. And I'll just run through these, which you can look at later, but they struggle to form human interaction. They struggle to form human interaction. Their conversations are odd. I want that thought about as we read. You'll see this, and this will be discussed in chapter two. It's really interesting the way these characters can't quite make ordinary human interaction. They also created their own mythologies, myths that they believe, myths that they believe. The wood, the terrifying nature of the wood, deferrals, the idea that they can put things off, and also they've created a sense of the importance of art. There's this pretense that art is important. They've created new myths. Likewise, the creatures created new myths that family life can be idyllic and you could be simply happy together in a cottage. He could be like the de Lacy's. These are myths that he wants to believe that, of course, aren't possible. Characters in Never and Frankenstein want to find a place to be at home. If any of you have ever studied Of Mice and Men, the key idea in Of Mice and Men is alienation. They are distance from themselves and others. They are alienated and literally different. They cannot fit in. If I imagined a title, compare the ways two writers you have studied at isolation. And we think about the ways they show isolation. Isolation, even though you're surrounded by people. Isolation within society, isolation outside society. Isolation, even though you look the same, the isolation of looking different. And again, you'll see we're thinking about things from a multiplicity of views. We don't just come down on one view. The isolation, even when you're surrounded by people, and then the physical isolation of creature. And that leads me nicely onto homelessness, and that being a literal and a metaphorical idea. For me, that's comparing with creature. They move from Hailsham to these cottages, which are very unhomely, freezing cold. They wear their boots inside. They trail mud through the house, and I would also compare that with a creature, seeking out a hut, seeking out a hovel, seeking out somewhere to sleep, to lay his head. Even Frankenstein, he's totally homeless. He avoids going home. He even spends the night outside the city walls to avoid going back to his family. When he marries Elizabeth, they don't go home. They go on a boat. Homelessness. And Kathy feels most at home with rubbish, with rubbish. So this is 282. She feels most comfortable amongst the trash. She goes to Norfolk and you can have a look at this annotation later and copy.
if you wish, for the debris you get on the seashore. The wind must have carried it, some of it for miles and miles before finally coming up against these trees and these two lines of wire. Up in the branches of the trees, too, I could see flapping about torn plastic sheeting and bits of old carrier bags. No longer useful. That was the only time as I stood there looking at these strain, that strange rubbish, feeling the wind coming across these empty fields that I started to imagine just little fancy things. Because this was Norfolk after all, and it was only a couple of weeks since I had lost him. I was thinking about the rubbish, the flapping plastic in the branches, the shoreline of odd stuff caught along the fencing, and I half closed my eyes and imagined this was a spot where everything I had ever lost since my childhood had washed up. That for me is a key quotation. Because she has not lost physical things, she's talking about losing a sense of hope. This is a metaphorical loss. And I was now standing here in front of it. And if I waited long enough, a tiny figure would appear on the horizon across the field and gradually get larger until I'd see it was Tommy. And he'd wave, maybe even call. The fantasy never got beyond that. That's the furthest her hope now goes, the idea that she could wave at him. I didn't let it. And even though the tears rolled down my face, I wasn't sobbing out of control. I, was, I just waited a bit, then turned back to the car to drive off to wherever it is I was supposed to be. Supposed. And normal are used multiple times in the novel. Who defines normal? Who tells us what we're supposed to be doing? And generally speaking, we as humans accept it. Cross-reference, page 65, where they learn about Norfolk in geography. Well, in the most loosest term of geography. And of course, we've got the sense of trying to bring back something, going to a place of lost things. So cross-reference, page 65, and also cross-reference page 146. And it's because, of course, Miss Emily doesn't have anything to say about Norfolk that they think it's the place of lost things. And then also 146, which is when they went there before and they looked out at the rubbish, her and Tommy. And then if we just look at the very end of Frankenstein for the same homelessness where they identify themselves with rubbish. By the way, something I've been looking at is value. These are just my notes of value, where they feel they are valued. 164. They are made from trash. Junkies, prostitutes, winos, tramps, convicts, maybe. Just so long as they aren't psychos. That's what we come from. We all know it. So why don't we say it? A woman like that. Come on. Yeah, right, Tommy. A bit of fun as if, as if they would get someone who'd worked in an office. We know it, so we might as well say it. If you want to look for possibles, if you want to do it properly, then you look in the gutter. You look in the rubbish bins. And for me, that is a key link to chapter four of Frankenstein, where he sews together bits of dead bodies in search and charnel houses, the graveyards, convicts, furnished my means. Look down the toilet. That's where you'll find me all came from. I find that really interesting. They, they align themselves with trash because they are made from trash. And then, of course, we've also got 105. They don't value themselves. 129. 221 and 282. If you just write down those page references, when you have my annotations, you'll get those. But those are to look out for. The way they don't value themselves, the way they talk themselves down, their lack of value. 105, 129, 221 and 282. Either literal rubbish or when they talk themselves down. Tommy actually says his art is rubbish. 